I think I was working as a nurse on 11 and 7 shift. And one of my brothers came to my job and said he had just heard on the radio that something had happened and both of our brothers were involved. One was in jail and one was at the hospital. So I left work and since one was in the hospital, that seemed the most critical, so I went there first. And I found Mumia. There was a fire that I was photographing and I had just gotten done taking those shots and I heard the call go out on H-band that an officer was down. And I flew. And from where I was to there, the most it could have taken me was 12 minutes. When I saw Mumia in the room, I really didn't know who he was. The police beat him up. His face was all swollen, lips were busted. I, that's why I couldn't recognize him. He was just so distorted. I saw the blood on the pavement that was Officer Faulkner's blood, so I saw it up close and personal within hours after it happened. And, uh, I mean, I knew nothing about Mumia Abu-Jamal and anything of the sort. He was out, and I shook him and shook him, and I told him he needed to have surgery, and, um, and he accepted that. And that's when he told me, you know, he hadn't shot anybody. He was found at the scene with a bullet from Danny's gun in his chest. Danny's laying on the ground. They find Mumia's gun right there at the scene. Danny shot four times with Mumia's gun. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He did it. We are murderers! This individual is assassinated a police officer in Philadelphia. I've lost all respect for the court system. I just don't feel that a slain officer can truly get justice anymore based on what I've seen with that case. I'll go for abolishing capital punishment the day after he's executed. If indeed Brother Mamiya is murdered by the state, it will be one of the most grave and darkest hours in the long night of terror in this country. 29 years after the murder of Officer Daniel Faulkner, the case of Mumia Abu-Jamal continues to raise controversy. For both sides, this is more than just a trial. It is a battle over what justice means in America. The following sequence of events, described at trial by the prosecution, has long been the official account of Officer Faulkner's death. In the early morning hours of December 9th, 1981, Abu Jamal was moonlighting as a cab driver. While waiting to pick up a passenger on a street in Center City, Philadelphia, he witnessed a confrontation between his brother, William Cook, and a police officer. He runs over and takes out this charter arms revolver and fires and shoots the officer in the back. The officer then manages to turn around a little bit because of the momentum of the bullet. It was not, did not affect the vital organs at that time and was able to get off the shot at that time, which hit off, uh, Mr. Jamal in the chest area. He then, that is Officer Faulkner, continued to fall down. And as he fell down straight on the pavement area, he was, for all intents and purposes, debilitated. The defendant, Mr. Jamal, at this point, having been stopped, and none went over and straddled the officer, took both hands and held the weapon that he pulled out previously and fired four times. One of the shots, that is the second shot or third shot, we don't know which, actually went through the, uh, in between the eyes of the officer's head. That was the killing bullet. I grew up with Danny's two older brothers, Tommy and Joe. We were born and raised in the same neighborhood, all in Southwest Philly. I've known the family my whole life. Danny was a nice kid, he really was. I've seen the evidence, I watched the trial. Mumia killed Danny Faulkner. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that he's not, that he's guilty. No doubt at all. On July 2nd, 1982, Mumia Abu-Jamal was sentenced to death. But irregularities continue to shadow his case. 
I started Crime Magazine, an internet publication that covers a broad range of crime issues. Innocence cases are one of our specialties, prison treatment. I started doing research thinking I would write an article about the case. Since I was familiar with Mumia as a reporter, I had an interest in writing a case about him, just to see where it would take me. Uh, the crime scene investigation, well, I don't know if there even really was one. Even on television, they handle investigations better than this was handled. Pedro Palakoff, a freelance photographer, was one of the first persons at the scene of the crime. His photographs were dismissed by the prosecution. Rediscovered 27 years later, the Polakoff photographs offer important new evidence. And there's the guns in the officer's hands. If this photograph was presented in court, they would have dismissed that evidence instantly as contaminated. There's no way that you're going to get a good fingerprint or anything off of a firearm that's been handled for upwards of an hour by somebody else. If you were a juror, what would you think if you saw that? Smell the gun. Tell me it's been fired. Uh, feel it. See if it's warm. If you fired a gun, there's these powder residue on your hands. Test that. So when the cops say they didn't do any of these tests, it just rings so hollow because these tests are so elementary that the only thing I can think of is that they were all negative. Polakoff's photos also illustrate other discrepancies at the crime scene. You'll notice right here on the top of the Volkswagen, we have Officer Faulkner's hat. This is the shot that the newspaper picked up. You'll now notice that Officer Faulkner's hat is down on the ground. I thought the man was guilty. I thought they had the murderer and that he had killed a police officer. And as far as I was concerned, he was supposed to fry. It's clear evidence that the police changed things around to paint a picture that they wanted to convey to the jury. Everything was not kosher. It wasn't done the right way. Something was up. I don't know whether he's guilty, whether he's innocent. I don't know who did it. But the man at least deserves a fair trial, and a fair trial means presenting all of the evidence. And if these photographs are evidence that that jury would have considered prior to sending a man to his death, then you know what? He, they should have seen it. Taxi driver Robert Schobert was one of the prosecution's key witnesses. His first statement is, the shooter ran 30 feet away before collapsing. Well, Momia was shot at the scene and didn't run anywhere. He's down right below the curb next to the police car. So now they've got a problem with, how can a guy who's lying down in the gutter here next to the police car have run 30 feet away? It doesn't make sense. So they re-interviewed Schobert and he now says, all right, maybe it wasn't 30 feet, let's say it was 10 feet. So he shaves it down to 10, but it's still 10 feet more than he ran. Now here's a guy on probation for throwing a Molotov cocktail into a schoolyard during the school day. He's violating the probation for driving a taxi cab without a driver's license. It's been revoked for two DUIs. His big lie is he parked right behind the police car. This guy wouldn't park behind any police car. He would go the other way every chance he got. If his parole was revoked, he was looking at 30 years in the penitentiary for throwing this Molotov cocktail in. So this guy's not taking any chances about casually being associated with a police officer that he doesn't have to be associated with. Polakoff's photos also cast doubt on Schobert's testimony. Apparently, the path that I took to come around the scene to get photos put me right through where a taxi cab was supposed to be that a witness was in. There's no taxi cab there. There was no cab driver that anybody was talking to. 
and I walked right past the cruiser in order to take the photographs. According to police testimony, Abu Jamal provided prosecutors with the most compelling evidence of guilt. He confessed to shooting Officer Faulkner. I walked over to him to look at to see who had just shot and killed my partner. And uh, he had shouted out that I shot the mf -er and I hope he dies. Um, he said it once more, and I leaned over and responded that he shouldn't die, you should. It's hammered into you in police academy and throughout your career that getting a confession is crucial to a conviction. And moreover, with the killing of a cop, a brother officer, you really want that conviction. Gary Bell is at the hospital that night. He gives a statement to police. He doesn't reference any confession from Mumia or talking to Mumia. I, I, didn't, I didn't write any notes at that time. I made no notes. I talked to uh, detectives at a later date and informed them of the statement. In fact, it took more than two months for Officer Bell and others to come forward and say that they had heard a confession from Abu Jamal. So several months go by. It's February. Well, the prosecutor's name is Joe McGill. He has a roundtable discussion with some of the police officers and Officer Gary Bell. Tells McGill, and it's hard for me to believe that McGill didn't solicit this, he heard a confession by God. And the fact that it came out in a room of cops sitting around talking with the prosecutor leading them, there's no way that that wasn't faked evidence. Plus, we have testimony from other people who were there that it didn't happen. I was with Jamal from within a moment or two of him being brought into the emergency room throughout his entire time in the emergency room and on into intensive care unit. And he neither made any confessions to me, nor did he say anything that would be in, in, even remotely in the way of a confession to any other individuals. When he was put in the paddy wagon, there were two officers assigned to stay with him from that moment until he went into surgery. One named Gary Watsko and another named Steve Trombetta. Watsko said, the Negro male made no comments at any time when he was in my presence. Now, since these are in police reports, the prosecutor knows about them. So does the defense, allegedly. So when the confessions come up in court, it just finally dawns on Mumia's court-appointed attorney, Anthony Jackson. Hey, I remember one of those cops saying that he didn't say anything. This is the last day of the trial. He goes to the judge and says, Judge, I've got a rebuttal witness. That would have blown the lid off somewhat of this trial. Even with the uh, circus, the prejudicial circus atmosphere surrounding the trial with all the cops in the courtroom with their guns and uniforms, uh, uh, it would have opened some eyes on the jury had they heard that because it just flat contradicted what the prosecution had been arguing and uh, trying to show. The prosecutor says, I don't know where he is, Judge, and it's too late to call him in anyway. Momia had read, though, in one of the documents about Watskill, no vacation. He was confined to the city. And Momia stood up and read this to the court. It says right here, Judge, he's not allowed to be out of town. He's here. Watskill was under orders from police department and probably McGill to be available in his home in Philadelphia. He could have been there in 30 minutes. The judge said that we haven't got the time. Probably the only lighthearted part of this whole trial was Momia said, I'll go find him. And the judge said, you know, I'll bet you'd like to. This is an example of prosecutorial misconduct. The prosecutor's job is not just to convict, but to see that justice is done. And why in this case did the prosecutor cover this up? Why was he so afraid? The single most important fact people should know about this case is that there was a fourth person at the crime scene. I was standing on a corner of 12th and Locust, this chit-chatting girl talk, and then we heard gunshots. Like, pop, pop. And I looked across the street to my like left ankle, and I seen this white person falling. And I kept looking, and I seen these two black individuals running away from him. I started to walk towards, but I came back and just got out the area. 
And regardless of what anybody says, I know what I saw. These eyes don't miss too much, not too much. Four eyewitnesses there told police that they saw one or more black men run from the scene. Those who told police that they saw someone running away were intimidated out of their statements. A few months before Veronica Jones was scheduled to testify in the Abu Jamal trial, she was arrested and jailed on a robbery charge. I couldn't make the bail. So I was sitting and I was visited by two white, white males in suits, but I was told they were my lawyers. So when I went down, they, you know, they told me that they were detectives, you know, and um, they were telling me <clears throat> how they could work a deal with me. They told me all I had to do was name Mubia as the shooter, Mubia Jamal as the shooter, and that they would make sure that I got off one of 15 years, five to 15 years, and also any other charges that I was already in there on, which, which were a number of charges. And they said that they had helped Cynthia, Cynthia White out, so they would help me out also. And you don't know how good that sounds to somebody that's going away for 15 years. I was totally confused. I didn't know what to say. I'm looking at a man I've never seen in my life that I'm getting ready to lie on. And I'm looking at these officers that can put me away. So I just thought I just said I didn't see anything. I'm sorry. After her testimony, Veronica Jones was released and given probation on all her outstanding charges. When Faulkner was brought to the hospital, in his shirt pocket of his, of his police uniform, there was a driver's license application that led right to Kenneth Freeman. Who was Kenneth Freeman? Kenneth Freeman is the business partner of William Cook. They were like this. Ike and Mike look alike. If you saw one, the other was either right beside him or not too far away. The driver's application never surfaced at trial because the prosecution did not divulge that it had been found in Officer Faulkner's pocket. The name Kenneth Freeman was never mentioned at trial. He's eluded us all these years because the prosecution hid his presence from the defense. We will always, always suspect that that was Poppy Freeman. Poppy grew up in a project with us, and he and Bill were very, very close. Um, they started their businesses together. They both were street vendors at one time. He had a good relationship with Moo, too, but he and Bill were closer to the same age, so they, they hung. They hung out together. That's why I called it the framing of Mumia Abu Jamal. I mean, they know there's another person at the scene. They know it's Kenneth Freeman, and yet they act as though there's only three. They do this deception to hang this crime on Mumia. A couple of years go by, Freeman's body is found bound and gagged, nude, in a parking lot in Philadelphia with a needle sticking in him, dead. When you have people like Poppy Freeman, who was involved in the case, who mysteriously died, or you have um, people who were witnesses to the case who were intimidated by police officers. When you see that people um, were threatened by police officers make us very afraid. Good evening. The U.S. Department of Justice filed suit against the city of Philadelphia, its mayor, and other officials, charging they allowed constant brutality in the city police department. The suit, the suit said people in general were abused and denied their rights, but the main victims were blacks and Hispanics. In 1979, the federal government filed the first ever lawsuit charging city civil officials with aiding and abetting police brutality. 
that legacy of police brutality is parallel to an equally ugly legacy of corruption. A federal grand jury indicted 13 Philadelphia police One officers. One of the biggest cases of police corruption in modern United in States In Philadelphia history. today, seven former policemen were found guilty of corruption. Former Deputy Commissioner James Martin and six others. Shortly after the Jamal case had gone to trial, the federal government prosecuted the police department in Philadelphia for corruption. Fifteen of the cops who worked on Mumia's investigation went down on FBI convictions, including the deputy police commissioner who was in charge of the entire Mumia investigation. It was bribery, extortion, manufacturing of evidence to win convictions, all the things that would lead to the kind of um, faking of evidence that we know went on in the Jamal case. This call is from the State Correctional Institution at Green and is subject to monitoring and recording. Some ask, what makes my case special? People are only able to ask that because they don't really know about many other cases where false testimony is used or biased judges sit or alleged constitutional rights are violated at whim. The many problems in Mumia's case plague thousands of cases every day in our court system. And those are usually the cases of young African and Latino men who aren't afforded the kind of justice that those who are able to pay for it have access to. For many critics, the Abu Jamal case has become a symbol of the relationship between the criminal justice system and people of color in America. That relationship was shaped in the cauldron of the civil rights struggles of the 1960s and 1970s. Now those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the fifth victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech well, what did he say before he articulated his dream? He articulated the nightmare. And he was saying, many of you were here weathered by police brutality. By the end of the 1960s, as the violence escalated, the civil rights movement became transformed. How often haven't we seen our poor, downtrodden people killed on the streets by the police without a car? <laughs> Eventually, the civil disobedience strategy of sit-ins, boycotts, and marches gave way to a more radical kind of activism, one that aimed to defend itself against violence. This new militancy was exemplified in the Black Panther Party. I was um, beaten into the Black Panther Party. I remember me and about four or five brothers from North Philly went to a demonstration in South Philadelphia, it's at the Philadelphia Spectrum, which is a big sporting arena. This was 1968, and it was the presidential nomination of um, George Corley Wallace III. I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Every one of us got our asses kicked uh, by plainclothes policemen. For me having to go through that and, and seeing the complete lack of power of people to resist that, I was attracted to the Black Panther Party. So because there was not a functioning, active Black Panther Party in Philadelphia at that time, we founded one and built one. I was in my mid-teens at that time. The FBI and the Philadelphia Police Department began their surveillance of Abu Jamal during his membership in the Black Panther Party 15 years prior to his arrest for Officer Faulkner's murder. At first, my mother was kind of like, boy, what you doing? You, 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 you better not go to jail. You better not get in no trouble. But, you know, just like a protective mother. But I heard my mother, I heard my mother say, yeah, he's out there doing this when he was in the Panther Party. You know, it was like, you could hear the pride. You could hear that she was glad that he was doing something, but not out in the street, gang war, not doing drugs and those kind of things. 
the Black Panthers came out of a condition. The condition was that we were being backed against the fence, mistreated by police officers, um, um, shooting down people in the streets, you know, stuff that's happening today. And the Panther Party felt like they could make a difference by policing, um, by looking at what police officers were doing, observing, taking names and numbers. Um, but on the other hand, they would be, they would be and could be confrontational. We tried every day, seven days a week, to love and serve our people. We served thousands of children every day hot and healthy breakfasts in many cities. We held free clothing drives. We had free medical treatment centers in over a dozen cities. Those are some of the programs that we instituted every day or weekly in 44 cities and branches across the country. As this new radical politics empowered black and Latino communities across the country, it also tapped into some of the nation's worst fears. In Philadelphia, the backlash against these movements was particularly extreme. Our campuses are in turmoil. Crime is rampant in the streets. Morality is in decline. And old ideals and traditions are being challenged. Frank Rizzo was the you know, former police commissioner who came up through the ranks. He got to where he was by being a very tough guy. Only in America, could a guy like Frank Rizzo be elected mayor? Yeah! He was law enforcement, hard on crime, we're locking him up, we're not taking any nonsense. This soft line attitude that is now prevailing across the country must stop. And that's the mentality that was here in the, in, in the 70s. Uh, he was the big tough sheriff in town and as mayor he was going to make sure that the streets were cleaned up. The right-wing surge that we saw as law and order was a direct reaction to the black power movement. Frank Rizzo was an overt white power politician. At a speech in South Philadelphia, he said, we want white power, quote, unquote. Those were his words, not ours. These are anarchists who print venom, kill, kill the pigs, kill this. They should be arrested and confined to prison where they belong. Anyone who was perceived as radical, anyone who was critical of the system was targeted for police abuse. In November of 1967, black students in the city of Philadelphia hold a protest in front of the school district. They're asking, yes, for the teaching of black history, but they're also asking for roofs to be fixed so they don't get rained on and to have heat in the schools in the winter time and to have school books that are not circa 1944 in 1967. Rizzo unleashed his police department on these peacefully protesting students. Over two dozen students were put into the hospital. So this is the city that Mumia grew up in. Frank Rizzo was a paradigm of things to come. If you look across America, what you see are people trying to repeat the kind of politics that he brought to fore. Today, a violent crime is committed every 60 seconds, and it will get worse unless we take the offensive. We shall have order in the United States. By the late 1970s, a new movement of black radicals caught the attention of Mayor Rizzo and the Philadelphia police. There was an ongoing battle in Philadelphia, police against MOVE, Rizzo against MOVE. MOVE being back to nature types, composting in the yard, lots of pets, all in dreadlocks, total counterculture deal. This brought the worst out in Rizzo. The police will be in there to drag them out by the backs of their necks. They're going to be taken by force if they resist. Most of the media treated it as the MOVE people were barbarians. and Momia treated them as urban revolutionaries willing to stand up to a totalitarian guy like Rizzo. It had a boiling point in 1978 when the police destroyed the first 
move compound. Uh, they put in this thousands of gallons of water into the basement to flush them out. And there's hundreds, maybe thousands of shots going toward this house. One of these shots in the crossfire kills one of the stakeout officers named James Ramp. There are 11 or 12 move adults in this house at the time. All are arrested and charged with Ramp's murder. Mumia covers this trial and is aghast at how could a judge find nine people guilty of killing one man with one bullet. Sitting in a trial in an official capacity, objective as a journalist, and seeing that kind of naked injustice, it rankled me to the core. All the rights that are supposedly guaranteed to a people, the right of self-representation, the right to self-defense in your trial to defend yourself, were, were summarily stripped and denied. Um, never in my wildest dreams would I ever think that it would happen to me. One day, I get a manuscript, and it's called Live from Death Row, a group of vignettes about people on death row. Mumia has written seven books. Six of them have been published by me. Every one of them is still in print. When I think of what he could do as a teacher or as a broadcaster in the general society, this country is missing so much to have him incarcerated when he could be the best teacher in the world. Jamal is more famous than he was when he was convicted. He's now a, a prominent, well-known international figure on death row and a journalist, writes about uh, not just the American legal system and prison system, but he writes about all kinds of political issues that, that get attention around the world. In 2000, Amnesty International published a report claiming that the case failed to meet minimum international standards safeguarding the fairness of legal proceedings. Its report called for a new trial. People in Philadelphia haven't read the Amnesty Report because when the Amnesty Report came out, the Philadelphia Inquirer put the Amnesty Report on page two of its B section as a news brief item, 55 words long. And virtually no other newspaper in the country covered it. The Daily News didn't cover it at all, and neither did Channel 3, 6, 10, or KYW News Radio. So this information about the case that other people around the world access easily, it's just like it just doesn't exist in Philadelphia. His writings, his talks, uh, everything that he's, he's come out with has been a great support for building, um, you know, social justice movements uh, worldwide. The man's fighting for me like he's fighting for my children. He represents a whole community of people, people like me who are men of color, um, who are subject to racial profiling by, by the police. So that's why I'm here, because he represents us. He represents me in a lot of ways. We know that it is not about just Maria. We know this is about our children. We know this is about all those who stand up as we the power. We have a right to demand that we be treated as human an international movement has mobilized to save Abu Jamal's life. In Philadelphia, an equally passionate movement demands his death. I'm a teacher. Who are you? Why don't you tell us that? Why don't you tell us that? Stop shaking. 
We're a police organized motorcycle group, the Philadelphia Centurions, exercising our constitutional rights. We don't believe in this uh, so-called person. He was uh, convicted by a, a courtroom of his peers over 25 years ago, and the man should be put to death. Those pushing for Abu Jamal's execution have a powerful ally in Philadelphia's fraternal order of police. Our brother, police officer Dan Faulkner's life was taken from us as he sought to protect his fellow citizens, your people, from that certain harm that faced them at the hands of another who was determined to carry out evil deeds. Police officers hear a gunshot, they run towards it. Civilians run away from it. The average cop probably goes out on the street every day and does his job to the best of his ability, despite what happened to Danny Faulkner. I believe, down deep inside, that had he been executed, justice would have been served. That would make police officers in the city of Philadelphia feel that they are being supported and backed up by the system, which they all believe in. They believe in that system or they wouldn't be cops. He murdered a police officer. That's about it. We're not going away. We're not going away. Anybody who supports this killer is tacitly saying that they sanction the murder of police officers. Let's talk a little about what happened this week. Rage Against the Machine is a rock group that came to Philadelphia. They performed at the first Union Center. Well, we don't have a rock group here. We have a hate group put to guitar music. Two of their biggest hits are Killing in the Name and Bullet in the Head. We're not talking Peter, Paul, and Mary here. Across the country, it represents a case of justice denied. There's no new evidence, and all the evidence presented remains uncontroverted. And still, the system has not had the integrity to carry out the verdict. If it had been a murdered judge, the guy would have been executed 20 years ago. This man has just sat here and lied. Bullet in the head is about cops killing black men, shooting them in the head. Rage did make it very clear that they are not about cop killers. And now you know that they are calling for a new trial for Mumia Abu-Jamal. They made it very plain. And again, this is the intimidation that these people have used on people like Veronica Jones. They're talking about the FOP history, this government history. And again, it points to what liars and bullies these people are. This is complete, utter, absurd nonsense. This continually repeating call for a new trial is a cheap charade. If Jamal publicly admitted what he did and apologized to the Faulkner family for the horror he's put them through for 18 years, I think this issue would be put to rest. But they are convinced denied. that Mumia killed a cop. And there's no middle ground to you killing a cop. We have an element and I couldn't tell you where it comes from, that keeps putting out that vindictiveness, that keeps putting out that retaliatoriness, that keeps grabbing people and it's like, if you don't go along with what we say, we will get you. Officer Faulkner's widow, Maureen Faulkner, has no doubt that Mumia received a fair trial. It's emotional to think that Victims have to endure things like this for 25 years. Maureen Faulkner is the widow of slain police officer Danny Faulkner. Michael Smirkanish is a conservative radio host, radio host and columnist based in Philadelphia. Their new book is called Murdered by Mumia, A Life Sentence of Loss, Pain, and Injustice. Good. Maureen Faulkner always contends that those who support Abu Jamal are dupes and dummies, and they don't know the true facts. But when you look at the facts in the case, the true facts, you will see that there are problems here. There are problems that merit a fair adjudication of this. There are some photographs that have been released by supporters of Mumia, and they were taken by a freelancer named Pedro Polakoff. At some point in time, I called the district attorney's office and I said, I was a photographer on the scene. I have photographs of the scene. If you would like to use them, you know, please call me. Never heard anything from him. And I was calling them because I thought the man's guilty. You know, I've got photographs, you can use them. The defense attorney says he can have a field day 
with these photographs. Where have these pictures been for 26 years? I mean, where have they been? Why hasn't this man come forth sooner than now? Does it ever cross your mind that perhaps they're right? Do you ever no. allow yourself to consider the fact that perhaps he didn't do this? He murdered my husband in cold blood, and there is no doubt in my mind. I don't think Maureen has ever thought, what if we execute the wrong guy? I don't think she cares. I think she just wants someone to die because that is how, the, how she's been fed all of these years. I have to assume, as a human being, Maureen Faulkner was married to her husband, loved him, they had a relationship, and when this happened, she was totally traumatized. I also believe that the FOP needs her to say, I want this man killed so I can move on with my life, or I want this man killed because he killed my husband. If Maureen Faulkner isn't there to push that my loving husband piece. They wouldn't have a stone to stand on. Justice for Daniel Faulkner is that they find who killed him. And that will also bring Maureen peace too. Has she suffered in this? Yes, she has. But so has Mumia's family. This guy has been on death row for 25 years. His children, who were babies, are now adults and now have their own children, and he has never been able to touch them, kiss them, hug them, hold them in 25 years. He's our father, he's a grandfather, He's innocent, and he should be home. I remember Mumia carrying my baby sister on his shoulders, and we going to the park, and him making sandwiches for us, and then we wake up, and he's gone. And it makes me sad because the memories, they're just memories now. He's been a father through letters, and a father through phone calls. I'm 32 years old. I've been going through this since I was six years old. I'm tired of it. Ready? Hello, who we have here is Miss Dolly. This is Goldie's daughter, her one and only, the love of her life, and one of Mumia's many grandchildren. We all, we love him so much, and we're not going to stop until he's home. Put your hands together for Goldie, y'all. Where you at, Yo, Goldie? What's up? What's up? Yo. Goldie Locks, call me Gang Wolf. Free Mumia, what you want? What's up? The yeah. state is yeah. trying to murder an innocent man, and we're not going to stand silent and allow it to happen. I come from a struggle most people couldn't imagine. A seven, see my family burning Bible on The fact is, they were revenge for a crime that was committed. Mumia ain't no killer ass. When he started having children, you only saw Mumia with his children. You know, he would carry him on his back, or you could see, you would see, he would come to visit my mother on his bike, and he would have one of his children on his back or on the bike or whatever. He always had his children, was always teaching. Um, that was who he was. Mumia actually taught us how to be affectionate. My mother grew up without a mother and father. She was an orphan by the time she was five. I don't think that my mother really knew how to be affectionate. And I think Mumia brought that to her. Um, and, and he would always walk in and just grab her up. And my mother was all of maybe 98 pounds, maybe. And he would just grip her up and just, mm, mm, you know, these bear hugs and things. And you just, boy, get off of me. Boy, get out of here. Get out, you know. One of the hardships was when my mother died, 
We couldn't be with him to support him. So that's something he had to go through alone. From day one, when I went to the hospital and found my brother in the hospital, he said, I'm innocent. And he's always said, I'm innocent. He being innocent and locked up all of this time, deprived of his life, his livelihood, his family, bothers the hell out of me. And it hurts. It hurts constantly that we can't touch him. We can't cry with him. We can't laugh with him. It hurts. Fame and icons are always obscure. I mean, that's, that's what they do in a way. It's made me less real to a lot of people. You know, I'm a poster or a book, perhaps. I'm not a living, breathing man like every other human being. And yes, I've got a family, a loving family, but they didn't sign up for this. So I rarely discuss them or mention them. I have always maintained that the framing of Bumia started with them saying that here we have somebody on the crime scene, and this is the nigga who did it. I don't think initially they knew it was Mumia Abu-Jamal or even cared. They saw somebody with dreadlocks. They probably figured it was moved, you know. So this is a guy, we got him, and, and we're going to do this. But when you look at the context of police brutality in Philadelphia, in the context of systemic injustice in Philadelphia, what happened to Mumia happens to so many other people. In Philadelphia, federal prosecutors are widening their investigation now into police corruption there, issuing subpoenas for 100,000 old arrest records going back a decade. It's all from the conviction of six officers for false, or false arrests and brutality. The scandal has led to the reverse Good evening. The U.S. Justice Department opened an investigation today of the latest case of alleged brutality by a big city police force, black and white officers, against an African-American suspect. The incident in Philadelphia... Almost on cue, every three to five years, there is a major scandal involving police corruption and or police brutality. In the United States, Philadelphia police have launched an internal investigation into what happened during this traffic stop. After a high-speed chase, a handcuffed man is hit at least seven times. The man, we're told, was later released without any charges filed. There's a mindset in law enforcement across the country that the means justify the extremes. If you take that type of modus operandi and you overlay it onto a murder of a police officer, they're going to do all that they can to pin this on somebody. And that's what they did with the Abu Jamal case. I started in April of 1978 as a Philadelphia assistant DA. It was the mentality at that time of being aggressive, strong, you know, carry the big stick mentality. The more aggressive you are, the more convictions you get, the more likely you are to move up and into more uh, prestigious roles within the DA's office. That can, doesn't always, but can create some injustices along the way. There's no doubt that the killing of a police officer takes on an extra added incentive in a prosecutor's office. Because they work with the police every single day. It's like killing one of their own, in, in a way. I mean, you go over to the DA's office right now, there'll be 75 police officers in there prepping, working on cases, this and that. So there's a real bond between defense, uh, between police and uh, uh, district attorneys. So when a police officer gets killed, there's a, 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 a whole different mentality that the office takes on. The prosecution is afforded enormous financial resources as well as time and personnel. The reason resources are important in capital cases is that investigators are needed, forensic experts, ballistic experts, those all require money, uh, not only to do the research but also to testify in the actual case. And it is a sad fact that most capital defense attorneys have very few resources afforded to them. If you're court appointed in Philadelphia, you're given, given a limited amount of money to do an enormous amount of things. I think 
um, when all was totaled up, I think for investigative, ballistics, pathologists, and other uh, professional services, there was perhaps less than $1,000 that was used and approved by the court. In political cases where the district attorney is invested in the outcome of the case, such as in the case of Mumia Abu-Jamal, I believe those resources are unlimited. I think the state will go to whatever uh, expense it needs to get a conviction. Mumia was denied the right to uh, trial by a jury of his peers because the peremptory challenges were used to eliminate blacks from the jury. Both sides are trying to get uh, the, the jury most likely to do whatever they want them to do. In the 1980s, Jack McMahon made a training tape for the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. The video detailed the tactics used by prosecutors in the office to get convictions. Uh, there's the blacks from the uh, uh, low-income areas are less likely to convict. And as a result, you don't want those people on your jury. The elimination of blacks from juries is, is a problem all over the country. McMahon's tape, unfortunately, uh, detailed a common practice. You know, in, in, in selecting blacks, again, you don't want the real educated ones. Again, it's, it's, it's the process, by giving any individual these strikes to use to try to fashion a jury, in their best interest is going to result in certain classes of people being excluded. Uh, it's, it's inevitable. Eleven were excluded from sitting on the jury by the prosecutor just based on their race. Another jury was maneuvered off of the panel who had been seated, was replaced by a white juror who had actually said that he was biased. Philadelphia is a city of 40% black at the time. You're supposed to get a jury of your peers, and it wouldn't be fair to say in this case that he got a jury of his peers. The experience of black people with police is different. They're much more skeptical of police testimony. So to have blacks on your jury means that they're not going to accept everything that the police officer says just out of hand. And I think whites have a very different uh, experience with police officers in this country. Judge Albert Sabo was the original trial judge in Mumia's case. He was known as a political hack that favored uh, police and prosecutors prior to becoming a judge. Judge Sabo, by anybody's understanding of the system, was a prosecution-oriented judge. He had presided over, I think, 31 death penalty cases. 29 of them were minorities. We had the most death row convictions of any judge in the United States. As Abu Jamal's case began, Terry Moore Carter was working in the Philadelphia courts as a stenographer. A few days into Abu Jamal's trial, she overheard Judge Sabo make a stunning remark. He was speaking to another gentleman and made reference uh, that he was going to help him fry the nigger. He had apparently made up his mind already without hearing any evidence that Mumia was guilty and also made up his mind to sway the jury to make that same decision. Sabo's con conduct during the trial was an embarrassment to anybody who's a member of the bar anywhere, I think, uh, uh, that any judge would be that bad, that flagrant in his racism and abuses. And Mumia was just ideal for him. Here we have an African-American defendant who was very outspoken against racism and injustice, who was very vocal, who wasn't going to me meekly be led to slaughter, as uh, so many defendants are, uh, who stood up and fought and said, look, I, I have a right to a fair trial. I have a right to be treated as a human being. In speaking with other people and reiterating the conversation that I overheard, nobody raised an eyebrow and said, oh my gosh, or he didn't say that, or nobody expressed that they didn't believe me. I came to realize that this is the way the system is, that the appeal process will take care of it so nobody's too concerned about it and don't worry your pretty little head about it. The problems with Abu Jamal's case do not end with his conviction. Questions linger as well around his sentencing. For whatever reason, Anthony Jackson did not 
put on any mitigating evidence, and there was plenty of it. I mean, there were people who were available to testify on his behalf. One of the most important pieces of mitigating evidence was the fact that he had no criminal record. We aren't looking at a thug here. I mean, here you have an inner city kid, grew up in a project, single parent for the most part, and he's striving to get his education, he's going to college, he's trying to do the right thing, trying to take care of his family. The only thing left was evidence that was put on by the prosecution to this article that he wrote when he was 15 years old. The prosecutor literally brought in a tattered copy of an old newspaper article in which Mumia quoted from Mao Zedong about power stemming from the barrel of a gun in the context of the state having just murdered Black Panther Fred Hampton. McGill, who was an experienced prosecutor, used that phrase to suggest to the jury that this was a man who was predisposed to going out to shoot police officers. The prosecutor's use of Abu Jamal's statements as a Black Panther also violated Supreme Court precedent set in a case known as Dawson v. Delaware. Dawson v. Delaware, that Supreme Court case in which evidence of the defendant's affiliation with the Aryan nation was found to have unfairly biased the jurors against him. Yet in Mumia's case, evidence was introduced of his former affiliation with the Black Panther Party, a clear Dawson violation. That alone could have been the basis for a new trial. Abu Jamal's attorneys appealed his conviction, claiming that he did not receive a fair trial. The presiding judge in his appeals hearing was Albert Sabre. According to the Code of Judicial Conduct and the um, uh, common law that has evolved from it, judges are supposed to recuse yourself when their impartiality is questioned. Not that you have actual proof that they can't be impartial, but if their impartiality is reasonably questioned. Remember, there was this incident, you know, which should have had him disqualified. He was overheard saying, yeah, and I'm going to help them fry that nigger. Given all of the animus and ire and controversy and contentiousness surrounding this case, Sable should never have heard Abu Jamal's appeal, but he did. Time after time, the courts have ruled that nothing was wrong with the lower court proceedings. And that's just not so. We have textbook examples of violations of Supreme Court precedents and gross prosecutorial misconduct that in most other cases, were they not so politically animated, uh, would have been cause for a new trial or release from prison. In Pennsylvania, um, the justices have to be reelected every 10 years. I think something like five of the seven justices on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court have been endorsed by the Fraternal Order of Police. So, there's a tremendous pressure on them to please the Fraternal Order of Police. So it gets put up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And at that point, one of the new members on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court was a guy named Ronald Castile. Who was Ronald Castile? He was a former DA in Philadelphia. So Castile votes to reject the appeal, but then he issues a separate opinion saying, why I'm not going to recuse myself. He says, the defense is blaming me and saying I can't be fair because the FOP made me man of the year and they gave me money to campaign on and they gave me campaign support. And so they're questioning my ability to be impartial because of FOP support. Well, there's four other members on the court that received money from the FOP and he named their names. So now we have five members of a seven member court who have taken money from the FOP, which is the prime organization trying to get Abu Jamal executed. In April of 2009, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear Mumia's appeal. We have an increasingly conservative Supreme Court that falls on the side of favoring law enforcement justices over due process interests. I don't believe they will ever take Mumia's case. Uh, it's too highly politicized. They don't want to take cases like this. And um, they're not brave enough to take a stand and do the right thing and say, 
egregious lower court violations throw it back for a new trial. Philadelphia seeks the death penalty more than any of the other 62 counties in Pennsylvania. When you look at straight numbers, Pennsylvania has more blacks on the death row than Mississippi, more than Alabama, second only to Texas. So that shows you a little bit about the racial cast of justice and how justice is applied here in Philadelphia. There's approximately 3,000 people on death row in the United States. These are all individuals who spent anywhere from two to 20 years on death row for crimes that they did not commit. Uh, they were all wrongfully convicted, exonerated, and released. And all of these people are members of our organization who now speak out against the death penalty. There have been Six individuals from Pennsylvania have been exonerated from death row. Think about it. Tom Ridge will make the changes we need. Life means life. Try violent juveniles as adults. Change rape and domestic violence laws and sign death warrants. Tom Ridge signed hundreds of death warrants as governor. Uh, obviously uh, was notorious for signing death warrants um, more than any other governor in Pennsylvania's history. Tom Ridge, when he ran for governor, one of his platforms was to sign Mumia's death warrant. He got elected, and he signed it. Ridge was a factor up until the point President Bush appointed Tom Ridge the Secretary of Homeland Security. The death penalty in this country, I think, is really used as a stepping stone to higher political office. They talk about how they're uh, tough on crime, and they, people love that, and they get elected. The DA at the time that Mumia was uh, arrested and convicted is now the governor of Pennsylvania. His wife is a judge on the Third Circuit Federal Appeals Court. People build their careers uh, from the incarceration of others. The system uh, tends to want to almost ignore the fact that uh, they've uh, sent these people to death row for crimes they did not commit. One person has been exonerated for approximately every nine persons who have been executed in this country. Now the state will not acknowledge that. We know it's most likely that somebody who has been innocent was executed. News. Good evening. There's a verdict tonight in the murder trial of a Philadelphian accused of killing a police officer last December. Our Walt Hunter standing by live at City Hall with the latest. Walter? The verdict, Diane, is guilty of first degree murder for Mumia Abu Jamal. I'm very pleased with the fact that uh, the jury had the courage to come back with a guilty verdict in the face of some very difficult circumstances. The whole idea of the justice system demands impartiality, fairness, and attention to all the evidence. Wade, you know, the old flying, the lady with the blindfold uh, is feeling the weight of the evidence. It's not who's before you, it's the weight of the evidence. In Mamiya's case, it obviously, uh, you know, the scales were tampered with. All of the problems that we saw in Mamiya's case characterize the thousands of cases that go through the criminal justice system through our courts every day. It's really a kind of new Jim Crow. A people's movement is essential to keep word of his case alive so that the mistakes that plagued his case are not repeated for others in the decades to come. Every one of these innocence cases educates the public, the future juries of the United States, that this system isn't what they read about in the civics class. Juries walk in the courtrooms right now thinking the justice is going on in here. 
that they think that, you know, the judge is honest, they think this prosecutor's a good guy, and that the cops don't lie. And then you keep showing case after case of this, that these cops do cheat, that the judges can be biased, and that eyewitnesses lie under oath. Take a look at this disturbing video in Philadelphia. It is a confrontation between Philadelphia police officers and three men, and as you can see, the officers are seen on tape hitting the men with batons and kicking them while they were on the ground. The systemic injustice is what I've talked about, the prosecutorial misconduct, the police malfeasance, the bias by judges. You see these things replicated in case after case after case after case in Philadelphia. In my mind, there's clear issues that merit a civil rights investigation. And at this point, they are just asking Holder to investigate. They're not asking him to take action. Take a look at it and you tell us what you see. I don't know if Mumia did or didn't. My thing is, if there is evidence to say that he did, why not a new trial? Because if the evidence prove again that he did, it'll be all over. For our family, we've like been on hold, waiting for Mumia to come home. We expect Mumia to come home. What would I be doing? Honestly, I can barely imagine. I'd probably be a fat and happy grandfather, babysitting a house full of grandkids, along with grandmom. What moved me? What touched me? I was always elated by the wave of love that I felt from people all around the world. In a time and in a place where you are the most alone in your life, I felt waves of love and support. That is one of the most amazing sensations in my life. Thank you.